You have a barn and you have a creek and you want to get the water from the creek in the barn without digging a trench or without power. We got a solution for that. We're going to talk about not getting overwhelmed by homesteading as a newbie. We're going to answer those questions and more in today's episode of Ask Homesteady. Let's dive in. This is Ask Homesteady. It is the weekly opportunity where you get to ask questions and I get to answer them here on our channel. What typically happens is you watch one of our videos and while watching one of our videos you say, huh, why is he doing that? What a ridiculous man. Bad enough he grew the mustache, now this? And then you leave a comment and you don't forget to put hashtag ask homesteady. And then I sit down and I search through the comments. I type in search hashtag ask homesteady. And then I see your question and I say, oh, I like that question. We're going to talk about it. And that's how I felt about this first question, which we're going to get into today. You want to get a question answered. Ask, hashtag ask homesteady. That's how you do it. Let's dive into this first one, which is really good. Salem wants to know, is your mustache necessary for survival? Absolutely, Salem. If I didn't have this mustache, just think, if I was in the wilderness and I needed cordage to make a bow drill to start a fire and I needed something flammable, I mean, it's all right there. Cordage, flammable, tinder, and warmth. I get warmth. I mean... The real question I wanted to answer, she says she's so excited. She wants to accumulate livestock and projects. She wants to build a large garden, buy and plant all the seeds. But obviously it's a recipe for overwhelm and disaster, particularly for new homesteaders. Yes, you sound like us like almost a decade ago when we started all this. How would you recommend someone hold back in expanding their homestead when new to homesteading? Like, do you have any tools or advice for helping someone have an idea of what they can reasonably handle starting out for their situation? So yes, I do have, uh, I have like, Salem, I wanted to have a cool name for this. I was like brainstorming, like, oh, I could call it, what could I call it? it uh, something really cool that they'll be able to remember. Maybe it will rhyme and it'll be like a limerick, and like a little leprechaun will appear on their shoulder and remind them in good times and bad. I couldn't think of anything cool to call it. So it's called the rule of one, which is like, I don't know, boring. If you can think of a better name when I explain this concept, then Comment below, please. Give me a better name for this concept. But basically, the rule of one, one animal slash husbandry thing and one infrastructure project. And imagine a scale. I'm looking around because I'm in a room with all sorts of props and I'm pretty sure I could make a makeshift scale really quickly. Okay, so imagine a scale, Salem, and uh, you won't even have to imagine the scale because I am going to make one for you, like right now, so your imagination doesn't even have to work too hard. Because that's the whole point of YouTube, right? You don't have to imagine if you can just watch a video. There's our scale, Salem. Whoa. And what we're always trying to do on our homestead is to achieve balance. Because if we're balanced on the homestead, it kind of brings our whole life into balance. Financially, you know, anxiety levels, we're feeding our family, ah, we're balanced. And what happens when you're balanced and then you get chickens? Whoa! Oh, things are unbalanced, right? So. What's the point of this rule of one? Well, it's a one-to-one -one ratio. So you have this beautiful homestead. It's a beautiful piece of land. You walk outside and you find pure joy just breathing in the air of your nice, beautiful homestead. Well, if you want to maintain that balance, that happy state, and get chickens, that's your one-to-one -one rule, right? Chickens are the one thing. And then over here, 
is your infrastructure. And so what you need to do is make sure at all times your animal slash garden slash something you have to keep alive and every day do chores for is equally met by infrastructure that will keep you balanced. I should have prepared this a little bit better with like things that actually weighed the same because it would be much better. But you get the idea. Stop messing with this ridiculous makeshift scale. If you move on to your new homestead and you want to get an animal every year, add one thing to one side and one thing to the other. And the pattern I suggest, you get your new homestead, have to balance bliss, you get your chickens. And to get chickens, you have to then get a chicken coop and you're gonna need to make sure there's running water. So right away, your first homestead endeavor, you're gonna be balanced. And here's where it gets you into trouble. What a lot of people do then is they say, okay, I got chickens, I got my infrastructure, now I'm gonna get goats. And then like, oh, overwhelm and crack, and just not happy. So what you should do is get your chickens with your infrastructure. And then from that point forward, your one-to-one -one rule, new infrastructure, then new animal or garden or whatever it is you have to keep alive and do chores for every day, okay? So, let's break this down. Start the first year, chickens. Oh, chickens or garden, those are both good things to start with. Don't do both. Because a garden requires work to keep alive and so do your chickens. And if we go back to our thing of balance, a garden and chickens are two things over here and no infrastructure to match it. Start with chickens, get your chicken coop. Then you plan for next year, okay? So you're in balance and you say next year, I want to, what do I want to do next year? This whole year goes by and you're taking care of chickens and you're you liking chickens and things are going good and you think, I really like this. Boy, I wish I had some scraps from a garden to give my chickens and fresh veggies to put into my omelets in the morning for my farm fresh eggs. Okay, so you want a garden next year. That's cool. So you got your chickens, you got your coop. Next year, before that comes, you want to have your next infrastructure piece ready. So build yourself three raised beds. Now you're heavy on infrastructure. The new year comes along, boom, you're planting transplants into the raised bed, you're back in balance. For the next year, you're thinking, I really like livestock, uh, I wanna add my own meat chickens. Well, guess what? Meat chickens are different than egg layers. You'll need more infrastructure for them. Maybe you wanna do chicken tractors for your meat chickens. So you build some meat chicken tractors, and then you get your meat birds. Or you just need another chicken coop because your chickens won't all fit in the one. So you get the new coop ready, meat birds. Um, you want to do dairy animals. Okay, well, we need a spot to milk these animals and to care for them. So we need to build the barn first, then in come the dairy animals. If every year you go one to one, the rule of one, one to one ratio, adding one thing, it's gonna feel boringly slow the first day you get to your homestead. You're gonna be like, oh, I wanna plant all the seeds and have all the chickens. But that, as you said, is a recipe for disaster. We have been there. We have been the new homesteaders on the new land just like so excited. And it would feel slow just doing chickens and then just doing pigs and then every time having to do the infrastructure first. It will feel slow. But here's what happens when you're designing your big homestead. The first year you get there, if you're like me, you're going to sit down with your mate and you're going to be like, let's plan this whole homestead dream forever. And you're going to like brainstorm and there's no negatives in a brainstorm. So you're going to draw your amazing pond that has the waterfall that's a continuous flowing system and it grows the algae that feeds the ducks that make the duck eggs which then produce you with food and your neighborhood which brings in money so that then you can own the goats that frolic along and do all the weed whacking meanwhile your cows in the field doing the lawn mowing and you don't have to own any machines because your animals do what they're supposed to do in nature and everything works perfect and this is what it's going to look like and let's do it all now you go and you buy all those animals and oh no 
they're not doing what they're supposed to. And I'm allergic to duck eggs and I just killed a goat because I let it eat a plant that's poisonous and I didn't even know goats could be poisoned. I thought goats could eat garbage and survive. What's with this? That's what happens when you get too much. You don't learn enough and you design too quickly and it doesn't work. So if you force yourself to go one to one, infrastructure, one animal at the most, I'd even suggest you go one to one, next year just infrastructure, next year just that animal, really slow it down. You then will, you will design slower and it will keep up with your actual experience. And so instead of designing this giant homestead that you redesign every year for five years, that is literally what we did at Squash Hollow. We got there the first year, we had this huge plan, we designed it, we put it into action. The giant garden we made, the next year, we realized we hated gardening and we tore it out and then we made it a giant pig pen. And then the next year we were like, no, the pigs destroyed that and they're busting up the fencing. So then we put sheep and goats in there. And then that was too little pasture and the sheep got worms and they died. And like, we just, it all went so fast and we learned so many hard lessons. And that's why we've kind of developed this reputation for like telling everybody to like slow down and do less. A lot of YouTube channels are excited and they want to get you know get you all riled up and you can live off the land, you can do everything and it's very inspirational and it's motivational and look, that guy on YouTube is doing it, I can do it too. And I want to inspire you and I want you to do this, I want you to live this life because I love it so much, but I don't want you to do what we did which was like dive in and burn out and then announce on your channel to everyone that you were done and you were never, you were going on a trip across the country and you were selling everything. <laughs> That's what we did. We didn't ever wind up giving up. Here we are still at it. We really do love it. But if you go too fast and furious, you will just, it's a disaster. There are years where things go wrong that just you've never experienced before. We had pigs for years and years, probably five years we were raising pigs. And then as I mentioned in this Q&A session, maybe in yesterday's video, uh, they got pneumonia. We've been raising them for years, never had a problem all the pigs got pneumonia and if that had happened and I was brand new and all kinds of other stuff was going on I might not have caught it I could have they could have all died so the rule of one-to-one -one, it will keep you moving slow and you will design slow because you'll say okay this year we're just gonna do this one thing with this one thing and then the following year when you sit down and start thinking about your next one-to-one -one, you're gonna say you know what We've done chickens for a whole year, and I liked them, uh, but I just found out I'm allergic to chicken eggs, like I did with ducks, right? Like, oh, it was fun, but, oh man, I'm allergic. So instead of designing everything around chickens, you know what, we're not gonna do chickens this year, but we have this nice little shed we've been using with the chickens. What could we use instead there? Well, I'd really like to try gardening this year. Let's convert it into a garden shed, and we'll garden this year. And that one-to-one, -one, now you're designing slower with the pace of your experience. That next year goes by and you're like, I love gardening. It's great. And that shed works really good for gardening. What would I like to do next? I loved having chickens, but I'm allergic to their eggs. But I learned on Homesteady, you can be allergic to eggs, but not meat. Why don't we do meat chickens? So now the garden shed can't also be a coop. This year we'll build a nice chicken tractor because meat birds don't need to be in a coop. They're only alive for two months. We don't have to worry about keeping them warm in the winter. We're gonna build two John Siskovich chicken tractors. We're gonna become a homesteady pioneer. They get discounts for John's books. Support Aust for his good advice. We'll get John's chicken tractor books at 10% off. That'll pay for our membership for homesteadies, uh, you know, keep homesteady going. And then that next year, you're gonna raise two chicken tractors worth of chickens. And you're gonna say, I really like this. I like the garden and I like these chickens. What are we gonna do next? Well, let's plan. Let's look at our farm. Here's the garden. We like it here. Uh, the chickens kind of work this here. What, what does it need? Well, the chickens are out here mowing this field, uh, but there is a lot of brush and brambles growing alongside of it. And I've been weed whacking it a lot but it wouldn't be hard to put a small perimeter fence over here and run goats in there to take care of the weed problem. We're still gonna need a weed whacker and a mower because, shocker, animals can't maintain a lawn like we expect it to be maintained in the 20th century. 
or 21st, are we in the 21st century? <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> People right now are going, why am I gonna take the advice of a guy who doesn't know what century he lives in? <laughs> the point is, if you go slow, you design slow, you keep up to pace with your experience, you will learn things you like and don't like about homesteading, and ultimately you will achieve a really nice balance on your homestead. And there'll be some years it goes one way a little bit, but you'll correct that with the infrastructure projects the next year. And then you'll go a little bit heavy in infrastructure and then you'll, you know, you'll get that animal and you'll be back here. But you'll be here all the time. And this, it's actually kind of good that my scale's not perfect because your homestead won't be either. And it will always need this, a little bit of correction. So way to go, suddenly designed illustration scale for accurately portraying what I was not going to. If you had been a perfect scale, you would have been a bad illustration because there's nothing perfect about homesteading. You're constantly going to be doing these gentle corrections. But you notice I'm gently correcting this thing while still like talking and I can think and, and carry a conversation. And that's how you want your homestead to work. You want to be able to make these gentle corrections and work with it while still being able to think straight and enjoy your life and you don't want to be doing this. Uh, uh, what did you say? Oh yeah, what? Go, huh? Like, you don't want to live your life like that. So, the one-to-one -one rule, or if you can think of a better name. That's my advice. I hope that helps. And by all means, get started, grow slow, Home steady, man. It's all about keeping it steady, right? Use the homestead, home steady. The road is rocky. Make home steady. That was our podcast saying, which the podcast will be coming back, guys. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Getting there. Poor Robert Jackson has been asking this for weeks, and I just couldn't ignore him anymore because Robert is really nice viewer. He leaves a lot of nice comments. Sorry, Robert. Took me a while to get to it, but we're covering it. The red fuel tank. Diesel. Where did they purchase? He's asking, Robert, any of you who have watched our barn videos, you see before the barn, there's this big red fuel tank. What's in it? What's the deal with it? That is a big tank for diesel. Now, as a lot of you know, my father-in-law is a metal fabricator. Uh, we mentioned from time to time, like, oh, he's got a metal fabrication shop. It's not just like a garage. They can make all kinds of really cool technical stuff. They work for power plants. They make anything the power plant needs. So that fuel tank is homemade. Um, can't buy it, but you could buy a fuel tank for your needs, Robert. And I really suggest for homesteaders who have like tractors and ATVs or rangers or gators, you know, vehicles on the property, it's nice to have a diesel tank. We did not squash all the farm because we didn't have the necessity for it. We didn't have all these machines to power up, but why do we here? Why are we going to keep using that even when uh, my in-laws go? Well, for those of you who don't know, uh, diesel or gasoline that's purchased at the gas station is taxed. The government is maintaining the roads. For every dollar of fuel you buy, you're going to be taxed and that money in theory is going to go towards taking care of the roads and we're not going to argue about how the government uses money today. We're just going to assume that the tax money from the diesel takes care of the roads. But off-road projects, on-farm, uh, construction projects, diesel can be used in farm vehicles and construction vehicles because they're not on the road destroying the roads that are being maintained by the government. So that diesel can be purchased without that in some some states, I know this to be true, I don't know if it's true in all states, but I'm going to assume it is, the same rule in all states. Let me know in the comments below if I'm wrong. Uh, you can get diesel tax exempt, <coughs> excuse me, by using off-site diesel. Now it's a different color. You'll notice the diesel you put in at the gas station is yellow, off-site diesel is red. If you put it in your diesel vehicle and drive on the roads and you get pulled over and they notice that, you're going to be in big trouble. But if you have a farm and a tractor and machines, you can buy your diesel tax, not have to pay the tax on it. 
You can get diesel cheaper because you're buying it in bulk and if you call a company up and say, hey, I want a couple hundred gallons of this stuff, what you'll get it better than at the pump price. So it's kind of like great for that. And then the other nice thing is uh, self-sufficiency or actually in this case, it's a self-reliance thing. Having diesel is not self-sufficient, it is self-reliant. You can put up a store of diesel and rely on that store for as long as you put it up for. Diesel lasts longer than gas. You can store gas you know, in the right settings. You can use a year old, up to about a year is what I've heard suggested on gas. Uh, if you rotate out your gas stores, you build a system where you know you get a five gallon container of gas every month and for each month of the year, you, you do that, and then the next year you rotate out your January, you use that gas, and then you put a new one up. You know, you can work through it in a year. Diesel will last much longer. So if you're going to buy it in bulk, you don't worry about it going bad, you don't worry about it putting it in your machines. The diesel will last, it has a longer shelf life. Less money, lasts longer. Storing diesel is a win-win. If you have a tractor and like, an ATV or, you know, like we have the Gator here, the John Deere Gator, it's the diesel. And uh, the tank will, you know, eventually if you get yourself a bulk tank, it'll pay for itself if you have long-term plans and a lot of diesel equipment that you're running on your homestead. If you just have like a weed, well, if you just have like a, a mower or something, it's probably not worth it to do, but, you know, big tractors, a lot of work with them and other machines might find it is worth the while. So, and I'm sure Robert probably, I mean, he already knew it was probably diesel, so he probably knows a lot of that stuff. He was more interested in where we got that tank. Oh, this question. I'm excited about this question. Another person that I will apologize to for having taken a couple weeks to get to his question, but John, I needed some time. I needed to really think about this one. And you went and you, you, what's the word? You flattered me by saying, I love your channel and your creative approach. I hope you can help me find a solution. And I was like, uh, he likes my creative approach. I gotta be creative and come up with a solution. And I think I have. So let's see, John, if it's, if it's gonna work. John threw a, a, a toughie at me. He says, I have a barn with power, but no running water. Do you have any good solution to get water to my barn? It's over 600 feet to the nearest running water, and I do not want to spend the money to put in a line. I was like, originally I was thinking, John, come on, like, you need water to your barn. It's not going to be that much money. You could rent a mini excavator for 300 bucks and get the line and material. 600 feet's not a far water line. You can totally do this. Holy frost layer. He's in Canada, and his frost layer is six feet down. Well, that changes things. <laughs> you could still do it with a mini excavator, but it would take you way longer. If you rented it, it's gonna cost you maybe a thousand bucks for the week, um, minimum. <laughs> if you pay an excavator to do it, it's gonna be a lot more money. His barn is on a hill, 60 meters from a small creek. He's been bringing water up from the creek every day and he doesn't want to anymore. No kidding, I don't wanna walk 60 meters with buckets of water to water your donkey nonetheless. I don't want to water a donkey ever. But hey, you got a donkey, not me, John. He has three sheep, two goats, and a donkey. So he is hauling buckets for animals, and he's in Canada, so it's in the snow, uphill. John, you sound like the story my grandfather would say, like, you know, I had to walk uphill with buckets of water in the winter with snow for a donkey. It's like every grandfather's story. Are you a grandfather, John? If so, like, you're probably a super healthy grandfather because you're hauling buckets. Anyway, I want to make your life easier on you, John, and so I, I was thinking, okay, what can we do here? John has power but he doesn't want to dig a trench six foot down. He's got a killer bad frost layer. Uh, he's got to dig six feet down to get past the frost. 600 feet, six feet down, that's a pretty big excavation project. And that will cost a lot more than the final like thing that makes this really challenging. $300 solution, John. I got a $300 solution. Sell all your animals, get your life back in balance here, do the infrastructure first. 
keep a couple of chickens. Anyway, I have a much better solution than that, John. I'm trying to work with what you said here. So, my first thought was to do what we would do back when I worked with, <clears throat> sorry, back when I worked with my father doing septic systems. A lot of times when we would go to a house that was on like a hillside, what would wind up happening is they would need to put a pump into their septic system. And so they would have a pump in this body of water and then a long, long pump line, which is a hard line of like one inch PVC or two inch, depending on your pump and your setup. And it would go up, uphill, no problem, and then dump into the fields because they're pumping the wastewater out of the house into the fields, uphill. And my initial thought was you have power, you could put a pump in the creek, and then you could, with a hard line of PVC, go all the way uphill. And what you need to make sure is at the top and at the bottom, the water could pump up the hard line of PVC, fall out the top, and then when the pump shut off, it would free flow back down out the pump and back into the stream. Moving water does not freeze. So this, we would do pump lines that were an inch under the ground in Connecticut. In Connecticut, we have a deep frost layer. It's not six feet, my goodness. Move out of Canada, John. But it would, you know, we needed a couple feet for frost layer, but it didn't matter in a pump line because a pump line, water is either moving up it or moving down it. And so you would be able to 60 meters you would be able to get about 200 feet of hard, like two inch PVC. I found online I could buy about that much pipe for $200. You could get a pump down at the bottom. You would need a strong enough pump to pump that. And I don't know that you could get a pump for $100 that would work for this. Uh, but because you have power in your barn, you can just run power, just an extension cord down, have it plugged into a GFI. I hope you have a GFI in your barn, uh, but you could run power to the pump and have the pump down in the creek, pumping up the hill. Now, when we would do a pump chamber in a septic system, the pump in the pump chamber would be hardwired into you know, wires which would go to a box and then that line would be run to the house. You can do direct berry wire which would be a much better approach from your barn down to the creek. If you can in the summertime bury it, the wire doesn't need to be very deep just to get it so that, you know, it's waterproof and then get your pump hardwired. Now the hardest part of all this is going to be your pump in the creek. And this is what really hung me up on this idea and leads me to your next solution, which I think is a better one if you can do it, but I'll get to that in a minute. The pump in the creek is different from the pump in the pump chamber. So in a septic system, a pump in a pump chamber, it's in a septic tank, which is buried and full of hot liquid coming steamy out of your house into there. So that pump is down in that warmer liquid, which is buried, and it never has issues with that pump freezing. It's always in water. In a creek, you called it a creek, I don't know, is there going to be a deep enough spot where it's constantly flowing water and it's deep and so your pump won't get frozen because if water got frozen around that pump, that wouldn't be good. You could encourage constant motion by pumping water up and pumping water back down and just leave the pump on all the time. But I don't know, is your creek going to ever run low on water and then you risk burning your pump out, leaving it running constantly or letting it get frozen if obviously the water wasn't there anymore. The point is the pump system needs electricity run down to it. That's more money. The pump's going to probably be more than $100 if you want to get water up the hill like that. You're going to need a better quality pump. Uh, I don't think that's the right solution for you all in all, unless your creek is real deep, you can find a pump that will handle that kind of push and you're willing to spend a little bit more than $300. Now, I've got a solution that I think will cost you less than, well, about $300. You won't risk burning out or freezing a pump and it works. Here's my caveat. I don't have experience with this system but that doesn't matter. I don't have experience going into space and I can still tell you how astronauts got to the moon. 
I don't have experience with what's called a ram pump. I've never built one. But there are people on the internet who have really good experience with them, did a lot of research into this, and I think the ram pump is your best solution. So I have a couple of things you'll find in the description below, a couple resources you can check out, people who have experience with this. The reason I know this should work for you is because it is working for Engineer775, that's a YouTube channel with a lot of subscribers. Uh, he shows in multiple videos, he's using a ram pump to water animals. Uh, also, House Land to House, that's another YouTube channel you can check out, uh, doing the same thing, setting up ram pumps to water gardens and things. What is a ram pump? I'm going to give you a video to watch. It was the best explainer video. It's like a minute long. So link below for the ram pump video and all these other guys, engineer and land house. Uh, but basically what a ram pump is, is you put a tube in a stream. Now your creek needs to constantly flow for this to work. The nice part is if it stops flowing, you're just back to hauling buckets, which you're already doing, uh, and no like expensive pump gets burned out. So. So you're eliminating the worry of the burnout. The creek flows into a feed pipe and the flowing rate of that water coming into that pipe fills up a reservoir. This little flap gets shut. There's air at the top. Water filling up in this chamber where air is being compressed creates pressure, which then pushes the water from this chamber. The little flap is closed from the pressure out. So you have your feed and then you have your um, you flow your water out. So you have your source water and then the water it's shooting out. And that pressurized chamber shoots the water uphill. It can shoot water uphill for you with no electricity. <coughs> so I want that to be clear. A ram pump doesn't need electricity to work. It works purely off of air pressure it's a very kind of old school tactic. A lot of off-grid homesteads are going to be using this to get water to themselves, to livestock, and to animals. They work in the winter too, so long as water is always flowing. Because remember, flowing water does not freeze. So the creek needs to always be flowing, always be feeding it. The water comes into the chamber, pressurizes that chamber, the air at the top gets compressed, pushes it back up the hill. At the top of the hill, you have a big basin. There's two ways to do this at the top of the hill. You have a big basin. The cheaper way to do this is with what's called a Y valve. At the top of the hill, for your $300 version, do a Y valve. The Y valve has a open spot here that you can turn on and off. This one can be turned on and off. When you don't need water, this one is flowing back downhill with a hose back to your creek. Continuous flow. No electricity needed. Continuous flow of water. Constant. As long as that creek's running. Never freezes because the water's always moving. You walk over to this Y when you need water and you go, you open the valve and psh, water spits out. You fill a bucket. I watched a video land to house. He did exactly that for his friend who had a garden. Now, I would suggest a little bit more money and you'd be over your $300 mark, get a big livestock water trough like you see we use for Ladybug. And that same system, this is what Engineer 775 does, big water trough, feed, it's fed into one side at the top, and then a little bit lower from the feed is your water back out in that same pipe down back to the stream. And so what that happens is it keeps the water moving in the livestock trough and now you have a continuous flow, but the better, why it's better for livestock is you have this giant reservoir full of water. So while watering a garden, you can just turn the hose on, water your garden, turn the hose off, which I don't know why you'd water a garden in the winter. Maybe you're doing like indoor gardening or something. Anyway, uh, you have a huge reservoir already full of water. So the minute you need livestock water, you just Take your bucket, you're already hauling buckets, now you just take a bucket and pour it into theirs. Or, you know, get yourself a little electric operated pump in your barn. That's more money, but you can do this next year when you're, you know, doing your infrastructure project for next year. And that continuous motion, you have a livestock tank full of water that's not frozen. It worked for Engineer 775. I'll link below to all these videos. I'll link to, uh, 
Link, uh, Engineer 775 teaches you exactly how to build a ram pump. He tells you his ram pump cost him $50 to build. The feed pipe will cost you about $200. That's $250. Bam! You are now no longer hauling buckets for under $300, John. Will it work for you? Your creek needs to be constantly flowing and you're gonna to need to check some charts, which I have links below where you can find these charts to make sure you're getting enough flow for enough push up that hill. Not super like DIY crafty guy, more like a haul and buckets kind of guy. <laughs> uh, you can buy a ram pump, land to house, sells them, and his biggest ram pump setup, which I don't know how big a one you'll need, but the biggest one he sells is $185. So for $400, you could get a big ramp pump already made and your feed pipe up to the top. Now, you are going to have to remember to get the water constantly flowing in the winter. You get your water up, it's only halfway, it's gotta go back down. So from the top, you'll need to get water back down to the creek and you'll need to do it at an even speed so your container that it's filling um, doesn't overflow. So you'll make sure your feed up and your feed down, your feed down is quicker. So what I'm saying here is 200 feet of pipe up the hill. You might have a spot on your property that's 10 feet away from your barn where you can just shoot it out below, but that'll cause erosion. So make sure you shoot it out somewhere where it won't erode your property. You might have to ride a whole line back down to the creek, which That'll cost you another $200. You could go with something um, cheaper because it's not your feed pipe. You could go with like 10 feet of good solid PVC and then run it into flexible four inch. That stuff's cheaper, you can get it in the big rolls. You're gonna have to get creative with this one. Like, you know, it's a creative solution for you, John, but you're gonna need to dive in and learn exactly how it all works, if it'll work perfectly for you, but conceivably for less than $300, or maybe just a bit more, you can get water on demand to your house or your homestead, your barn, thanks to that creek. And it will be cheaper for a fact than running water lines. Will it be better? This is where my lack of experience cannot help you. I have never used one. I can't promise you it'll be as worry-free but they're pretty ancient, like, this is like ancient science. It's like things people did before they had power. And uh, the Engineer 775 has had one running, he said, for I think it was like five or six years, constant. And he said with that one, he was getting a thousand gallons of water a day up to his barn and then back out. It wasn't storing it in the barn but we already talked about how you could keep a reservoir constantly moving. I hope that helped. John, come on, let me know if you do that. Please, hashtag Ask Home Study, I did it. Check out my photo on Instagram here because yeah, if you did that, that's cool. <laughs> and that's it for Ask Home Study this week. I hope you enjoyed three different videos, three different days where we dove into your questions. If you missed any of the other ones from this week, you can check out those videos on our channel. And we will see you tomorrow in our regular vlogs because our normal thing on this channel is homestead vlogs. We just take the weekend to answer your questions. If you like this, you know how to support us. Become a Homesteady Pioneer, it's five bucks a month. And that's huge in supporting us. And in return, you get bonus content, classes taught by other people, a few classes taught by me. You also get discounts on homesteading stuff. You can learn more about that by the link below or shop through our Amsteady, www.amsteady.com. Forward you to Amazon, doesn't cost you a penny extra, but what you spend there, we get a little bit of, and it helps us do this channel. Or tell a friend, ask a question, watch all our videos, let the commercials play before the videos. Can't do it without your support. Thank you so much, and we'll see you tomorrow. If you like this video and others like it, be sure to shop through our Amazon link right here when shopping on Amazon. It helps us support this channel and helps us to keep producing these videos.